Open the podcast bay door as hell. everyone, and welcome to episode 145 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. I've been a proud geek all my life, being into role-playing games, board games, sci-fi, fantasy, and especially superheroes and comics. And I want to help others join me in those pursuits, but i found that sometimes people can get overwhelmed or feel left out because they don't already have what some consider the requisite knowledge to be considered a fan. And that's where Welcome to Geek Town comes in. Here, you can ask your questions without feeling like a gatekeeper is calling you out for not yet being fully versed in every aspect of your new interest. With February being a short month, this is my last opportunity to shout out my patrons. My newest patron, Mike Sterling, whose blog Progressive Ruin about comics from a retailer's point of view is always worth a read, joins the rest of the crew, which is Justin Bailey, Lily Breen, Jesse Clark, Ricky Garvin, Rob Garrison, Aaron Woodward, Aaron Borst, Carla Hoffman, Lyndon Onstead, Julio Herrera, and Matthew Saint. Thank you to all of you for your support. And if you want to join in with helping the show out, it's just a dollar per month, and that gets you this monthly shout-out, as well as audio outtakes and full scripts of every written show. Before we jump into this week's topic, one last note. I'll be interviewing writer J.M. DeMattis, who has written some of the best comics out there, including the famous Craven's Last Hunt story in Spider-Man, and co-wrote the Bwahaha era of Justice League International slash Europe. Obviously, I have a bunch of questions prepared for him, but if there's anything specific you'd like to know, send your questions in to welcometogeektown at gmail.com and I'll pick out some of my favorites and pepper them in as appropriate. Now, finally on to this week's show. With Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, opening this weekend, I thought this would be a good time to discuss the comic book history of its main antagonist, Kang. Especially since it appears that Kang will be the big bad of phases 5 and 6 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, I'm writing this episode before I've seen the movie, so there won't be any spoilers for the latest MCU film, but if you haven't watched all of the Loki Disney Plus show and want to avoid spoilers from that, then you should go binge that before listening to the rest of this. Ready? Okay, let's jump through time to find out all about Kang the Conqueror. Kang first appeared in Avengers number 8. At least, that was his first appearance as Kang. I'll get there in a sec. In this story, written by Stan Lee and drawn by Jack Kirby, we learn some of Kang's origin as a time traveler originally from the year 3000. Well, that's the year he was born, so he probably left from 3030 or so. Bored with the peaceful existence of the era he lived in, he discovered the plans for a time machine from, quote, the ruins of an amazing ancestor of mine, end quote. Put a pin in that. He ended up going back in time to ancient Egypt and became the ruler known as Pharaoh Rama Tut. He left that time when the Fantastic Four arrived and forced him to flee, and ended up in the 41st century, which was now a savage post-apocalyptic world. Using his technology, he was able to take over this future world, renaming himself Kang the First. Now, you'll notice some of that story involved the Fantastic Four. His first appearance as Rama Tut was in Fantastic Four number 19, which had come out almost a year earlier. He also appeared in Fantastic Four Annual number 2, where he ended up meeting Doctor Doom, who was his ancestor. In this story, they believe that they somehow might also be the same person, but that turns out not to be the case. 
So already in three stories, we have three different identities, mistaken in one case, for the same person. This is a constant for Kang. As an apparently long-lived time traveler, he's taken on many roles over the years, and his story has grown more and more complex. Now that we've gotten his first few appearances out of the way, let's lay out his history in chronological order from his point of view. Bear in mind these various revelations about his history have come out in dribs and drabs over the years. But if you want a great story that covers a lot of these, as well as being filled with Avengers from all over Marvel's history, check out the miniseries Avengers Forever, written by Kurt Busiek, with art by the late, great Carlos Pacheco. Kang was born as Nathaniel Richards, which, not coincidentally, is also the name of Reed Richards' father. He was named for this distant relative, but also believes Victor Von Doom is a forefather of his as well. Using Doom's plan for a time machine that he found, the amazing ancestor from earlier, he went back to ancient Egypt as discussed. His original plans involved taking Ansaba Nur, the man destined to become the mutant Apocalypse, as his heir, but his defeat by the Fantastic Four ruined that plot. He meets Doctor Doom, and, inspired by his possible relative's fashion choice, designs his own armor, dubbing himself the Scarlet Centurion. Using his technology, he's able to pit the Avengers against an alternate version of the team. The Scarlet Centurion has returned a few times since then, but it was either an alternate timeline version of the character, like in the Squadron Supreme miniseries, or someone else in the armor, like Kang's son, so we'll move on from there. It's on his way back home from this trip that he ends up in his own future, and takes on the role of Kang the Conqueror for the first time. As Kang, he returns to the 20th century multiple times to try to defeat the Avengers. We also see him fall in love with the princess from one of the kingdoms in his 41st century home named Ravona Renslayer. If you watched the Loki TV show, you may remember her as the head of the TVA, which was our first clue that he would be involved in the show somehow. During one of these stories, Ravona saves Kang's life by taking a potentially lethal blow from a weapons blast aimed at him, and Kang puts her in stasis. His next story finds him making a bet with the Grand Master, one of the elders of the universe, which, if he wins, would temporarily give him the power over life and death. However, in the end, he has to choose power over life or death. And rather than return Ravona back from the dead, he tries to kill the Avengers, but is stopped by Black Knight, who was not technically on the team at the time. We later find out that the Grandmaster resurrected Ravona himself and told her of Kang's choice, leading her to become a character named Terminatrix, who mostly fought against Kang due to anger at his decision. In one of his next storylines, Kang appears at Avengers Mansion seeking the Celestial Madonna. You may or may not recall from episode 101, mostly about the swordsman, that the Celestial Madonna was Mantis. Yes, the same one from Guardians of the Galaxy, but at the time she was a member of the Avengers. He wanted to marry Mantis, knowing that she was destined to have a powerful son. His second attempt at claiming a powerful being as his heir. However, a future version of Kang, who had grown tired of conquest, ended up helping the Avengers to defeat this younger Kang's plans. It's during this story that we learn that another time-traveling character named Immortus is also a future incarnation of Kang. Like Rama Tut, who also appears in the Celestial Madonna Saga, Immortus actually first appeared in the comics before Kang specifically in Avengers number 10. But the connection between these two is truly a retcon, with Avengers writer Steve Englehart adding this new revelation a decade after both characters had been introduced. In the Loki TV series, a character called He Who Remains 
is revealed to be the true force behind the TVA and is played by Jonathan Majors, who plays Kang. While he's not referred to as Immortus in the show, many fans felt that the characters were very similar, from his motivations down to aspects of his wardrobe. In addition to having multiple identities over his lifetime, there are also multiple versions of Kang himself. Due to his many trips through time, Kang has created many alternate timelines, each with its own version of Kang. Many of these Kangs have allied themselves as the Council of Cross-Time Kangs. Try saying that five times fast. But, one who rejects the Council and goes his own way is the one we follow most of the time, and is referred to as the Prime Kang. In fact, he and Ravona, who was at least temporarily back on his side, end up killing the Cross-Time Kang core, leaving him once again the one and true Kang. As I mentioned before, Avengers Forever not only contains a great summing up of much of Kang's history, but also is important to his future. I won't go into too many details because I really recommend reading it, but it involves Kang deciding that he does not want to become Immortus in the future and using Avengers from all over the space-time continuum as pawns in an attempt to thwart that fate. If, like me, you love time-traveling stories, this one's a doozy, and I can't recommend it enough. Writer Kurt Busiek, with artists Alan Davis, Karen Dwyer, Rick Remender, Ivan Reyes, and Manuel Garcia, returned to Kang's story in the main Avengers title in a year-long storyline referred to as The Kang Dynasty. If you're following MCU news, you may recognize that as one of the future Avenger movie titles that has been announced. In that story, Kang, along with his cloned son Marcus, once again tries to take over in the 21st century and is nearly successful, but once again is defeated by the Avengers. The story ends with Kang killing Marcus, as along the way Marcus became infatuated with Carol Danvers, known now as Captain Marvel, but going by the codename Warbird at the time, and subtly helped her defeat one of the villains allied with Kang, and Kang cannot abide a traitor in his ranks. Kang once again created an alternate version of himself when he went back in time to try to prevent his younger self from being put in a coma when he confronted a bully. While he did succeed at that task, the young Nathaniel is horrified to learn of the man he is to become, and ends up retreating into the past to actually recruit a new team of young Avengers, calling himself Iron Lad. The older Kang tracks down his younger self, but the team not only defeats, but kills Kang. Unfortunately, this causes a paradox, and Iron Lad is forced to return to his original time, wiping his memory of his stint as a hero. Just a couple of years ago, Kang actually got his own miniseries, fittingly titled Kang the Conqueror, where the time traveler once again went to his own past, and sped his younger self through all of his previous identities. Iron Lad, Rama Tut, then Scarlet Centurion, until recreating himself once again as Kang, but a more distilled version of the character. This storyline also resurrected Ravona once again, who had died off-panel in the pages of Avengers Forever, through the power of reincarnation. In addition to all these iterations of the Prime Kang, We've also seen in the comics other alternate Kangs, such as the early 20th century Mayor Victor Timely, 21st century businessman Mr. Griffin, and the TVA agent known as Chrono Monitor No. 616. Each of these characters is from an alternate timeline that did not take the same journey as the main Kang, and also only had one or two appearances each which is why I'm not focusing much attention on any of them. While Kang has no powers on his own, he's constantly bringing out different futuristic gadgets from his armor or his time ship that give him the ability to mimic all sorts of powerful abilities. And his knowledge of time allows him to find just the right spots in history where mankind is most vulnerable to being conquered. Despite his many defeats mostly at the hands of the Avengers, 
Kang continues to be considered one of the most dangerous foes the team has ever faced. So he's definitely a worthy antagonist for the next big arc of the MCU, especially while being played by such a talented actor like Jonathan Majors. Like I said, as I write this, I haven't seen Quantumania, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Kang in that and future MCU projects. I hope this has gotten you excited for it as well. Meanwhile, don't forget that I'm always looking for questions that you want to hear answered for future episodes. Or just let me know what you think of the show in general by dropping me an email. My email address is welcome to geektown, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Or you can go to the website, welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com, and click the submit a question link if you'd prefer to remain anonymous. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown, twitter at geektown podcast, or mastodon at welcome to geektown at mastodon.social. Also, if you'd like to support the show directly, why not become a patron at patreon.com slash welcome to geektown for just a dollar per month to get access to full scripts of the shows, audio outtakes, and a monthly shout out. You can also help the show grow by subscribing and giving a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts to join the Geek Town City Council, which helps other people find the show so we can all tell them, Welcome to Geek Town, Population, Us. Welcome to Geek Town is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Lovitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All of their sound clips are the copyrighted material of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended falling under fair use.